Good evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. We have come to you this night for no other reason but to lift up the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us. We pray that you will click the share button and start a watch party with your family and friends. Our scripture tonight will come from Psalm 100. And it reads, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Our song today is, We Have Come Into This House, Gathered in His Name, to worship him. So forget about yourselves, concentrate on him, and worship him. Lift up holy hands, magnify his name. We've come to just worship the Lord Jesus Christ. He's so worthy to be praised and to be honored. Help us sing, we have come into this house.
Father God in heaven, it's in the name of Jesus Christ we come. God, we praise you, we honor you, we thank you. We thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come before you. Lord, we praise you for you are good and you are God. You are God all by yourself. God, we honor you tonight, Father God, for you have given us another chance. Father, we thank you for another chance. We thank you for blessing us in spite of us, in spite of our meanness, in spite of our condition, in spite of our disobedience. Father God, you've continued to bless us. Now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for messing up. Forgive us for falling short. Forgive us for not doing those things that are pleasing in your sight. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we come before you to study your word. We pray that you bless us as we come before you in your word, that your word will be made clear, that lives will be changed, hope will be renewed, and faith will be restored. Lord, we ask you to keep the glory as we study your word. Bless us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, and anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. We come to worship, to worship him. The songwriter says, forget about yourself. <laughs> Concentrate on him and worship him. Jesus is worthy of all the praise, all the glory. He is worship. He is worthy to be worshipped, and we are to worship him. We are to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is to be worshipped. Hallelujah to the Lamb. We're here tonight for Bible study again. We're looking at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17 is where we are tonight. Colossians chapter 3, verses 16, 15 rather, and 7 through 17. Colossians chapter 3, verses 15, 16, and 17. Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17 is where we are tonight. Amen. Paul is continuing this study of telling us how to go from a good character to great conduct. The pericope that the portion of the this pericope that we cover on tonight will deal with conduct. Up to this point in chapter three, Paul has been covering our character, telling us to not be falling into, to not fall into cornality. Cornality is when you are saved, you're born again, but you act like you're not born again. <laughs> Cornality is when you you are born again, but you act like a heathen. <laughs> Cornality is when you are born again, you're saved, but you're not under control, under the control of the Holy Spirit. Paul has said in verses 1 through 14, make sure you check your cornality and make sure you walk in Jesus Christ with tender mercies. Be humble, be meek, be long-suffering, forbearing, and putting up with each other. The problem is today that we can't put up with very much of anything, and we will not put up with each other. But when we are in Christ Jesus, we have to learn to put up with stuff that we don't want to put up with and to put up with people that we can't even stand. But Paul says, make sure that you get your evil desires out of the way. So tonight, we, as we have dealt already with that character, and you ought to walk in Christ, in great character, tonight we're going to talk about how you need to walk in Christ with uh, great conduct. You have to walk in Christ with great conduct. You, your conduct ought to be such that you walk in Christ and carry yourself like you are a Christian. Christians ought to carry themselves as they are Christians. The root word, the key word is Christ to be Christ-like. So tonight we're going to deal not only with your character, but also with your conduct. Verses number 15 through 17 of Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. We closed on last week by talking about forgiving other people, and Christ has forgiven you, so you ought to forgive others. The analogy here is that we, as we forgive others, God forgives us. 
The analogy is if we don't forgive others, God don't forgive us. Doesn't have to forgive us. Amen? So we have to make sure we confess our sins, ask God for forgiveness, and move forward. Don't beat up yourself, ask God for forgiveness, and move forward. Look at Matthew, I mean, look at Colossians chapter 3, verse number 15. It says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. That's a lot in that one verse. <laughs> He says, he says, he says, and let the peace of God, let the peace of God. He didn't say make it. He said, let, allow the peace of God, allow the peace of God to rule in your hearts. So look at that word, peace. The word peace is, is tranquility. This is God-given tr tranquility. The word peace is condescendent. The word the peace transcends all barriers. The word peace is quietness. The word peace means to be at rest and also to be set at one. In other words, we must find peace. The word peace means to be in prosperity. Many preach and teach a prosperity ministry, but without peace, there is no prosperity. He says, let this, allow this peace of God. And the peace that we're talking about comes from God. Therefore, it is God-given. It is God's given peace. It is, it is tranquility. It is silence. It is, it is quietness. It is being set as one. It is without battle, without uh, war. It is, it is without confusion. When we have peace, we have no confusion. <clears throat> First of all, Paul says, let this peace be within you. In other words, this peace ought to be in you because you've been called to peace. You have to have peace in yourself. Too many times people have struggles going on in themselves, therefore they can't have peace with other people. We have to get to a point in our lives where we allow Jesus Christ to give us peace. There are many examples of peace. When you look at Jonah, Jonah, Jonah had no peace because he, dis, he was disobedient to God. I want to say to you today, if you're disobedient to God, disobedient to God's ways, then it is totally impossible to have peace. Peace comes when we are reckoning ourselves to God. Peace takes place whenever we're on one accord with God. Peace can only take place when we are obedient to him. We can only have that tranquility. We can only have that rest. Hebrews talk about the fact that we must enter into that rest with God. Hebrews chapter 4. We must enter into the rest with God. And we can't enter into that rest, that tranquility, that quietness, with God, we cannot be set at one with God unless we're obedient to him. Even the little white lies matter. We have to be obedient to God. Whenever the believer loses his or her inner peace, then that believer knows within himself and other folk can see it that he's in disobedience to God. Whenever the believer loses his inner peace, whenever the believer loses her inner peace, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that believer, it has been disobedient to God. I'm talking about peace within yourself. You have to have peace within yourself. And in order for one to have peace in the church, peace at home, peace at work, peace in the community, 
peace with their sorrows and their fraternities, that person has to first have peace with God. And we cannot have peace with God unless we are of God, unless we are born of God, unless we walk with God. And once we are born of God, we ought to have peace. We ought to have rest. That rest should only leave, leave us when we're disobedient to God. Therefore, he says, verse 15, Colossians chapter 3, and let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. This word rule is an athletic term. The word rule means to distribute throughout your heart. The word rule means to preside over. The word rule means to be, be declared worthy of the prize. You see, peace rules over us because peace resides over us, because peace is distributed throughout our hearts. The word rule comes from the same word we get the word umpire. The umpire is the one who who determines if, a, if an opponent or a player or a participant in the games are qualified or disqualified. The umpire decides whether a participant in, in a sport is, is either rejected or accepted. You see, the umpire is a lot different from the, the referee. You see, the referee upholds the quality of the game. The referee enforces the rules of the game. But the umpire, the, the, he, the umpire settles the disputes in the game. First of all, the referee, the referee makes sure that the rules are enforced in the game. The, the referee makes sure that the game is played with great quality by enforcing the rules of the game. But the umpire is the one who settles the dispute of the games. The umpire is the one who, who sets the record straight. Therefore, in the text, we find the word rule. The word rule means that it's only our peace that can set us straight. It's only the peace of God that creates an umpire situation whenever there's a dispute within us and without us, meaning there's a dispute going on within us, and there's a dispute going on outside of us. Look at what he says. He says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. Look at what he says. You are called in one body. He's talking to Christians talking to Christians. He's talking to people who are, are Christ-like. He says to us tonight, he says, whatever you do, make sure that the peace of God is the umpire over all that you think, do, and act. He says that the peace of God should be your umpire. The peace of God should be the one who sets the record straight. The peace of God should be the one who settles the disputes? The peace of God ought to rule over your heart, in your heart, throughout your heart. And he says, Father, that, that to which also you were called in one body. Now, not only should we have the peace of God within us, but we ought to have the peace of God within our church. Uh-uh. We ought to have the peace of God in us, and therefore that peace of God ought to become so contagious that it exists to the one body, the church. He says, look at what he says. He says, to which also you were called, you were called, you were set aside, you, you, will, you have been called to peace. God deliver the church from people who are in church to start trouble. God delivered the church. Lord, have mercy on the church who has just one person 
who, when he or she shows up, there's always trouble. I used to have folk at the New Beginning Church like that. We don't have that anymore. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You ought to be clapping in your house right now. We don't have that anymore. God is looking for peace, not only in the Christian, he's looking for peace in the church. And not only is he looking for peace, he's looking for the peace of God. You ought to be a peaceful person. You ought to be a person who, who has the rest in the midst of God. You ought not be one who starts trouble. He says, to which also you've been called. You've been called to be the peace in that one body, in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. You've been called to be peaceful. You've been, you've been called to have peace. You've been called to usher in the umpire. Mm -hmm. Bring the umpire in. You ought to be the one who, who is called to allow the peace of God to not only rule over you, but to also rule over those who are your brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Yes. On your job, you ought not be a hell raiser. You ought to have peace. You ought to carry on peace. You ought to, you ought to instruct people through peace. Lady, lady said, hey, I need you to counsel us because... Uh, we want to get a divorce. I said, well, I'm not a divorce counselor. I'm a marriage counselor. I'm not one who want to run you apart and get you torn, a, torn apart. I'm one that, that wants you to come together. And regardless of what you have done or what he has done, what she has done, God wants us to have peace in the house. He wants us to reckon ourselves together. Another thing this, this word rule is, it, it not only set settle disputes and set us at once, this at one, this word rule also means that we ought to let God's peace guide us in the midst of things. We ought to, we ought to have peaceful hearts in such a way that the peace can come on come in and be the umpire and settle the dispute. We must pray and surrender our will to the peace of God. We must seek God's guidance in the scripture. I just want to park right here and tell you the reason why some of us have not had peace in a very long time is because we have not let God's scriptures. We have not let the verses of the Bible. We have not let the whole Bible govern our lives. This word uh, rule means to have governance over. Yeah. This word rule means to, to, th that the umpire can come in and control what's going on, not only in your heart, but in your life and in your church. Mm -hmm. In your church, we are called to one body. We are a part of relationships. Relationships are important. It is very important to have godly relationships. Amen. You can't have godly relationships uh, if you have gossip going on. That's right. You can't have godly relationship when there is no peace. Mm -hmm. There must be harmony in the body. We can reach people for Christ if we can show forth harmony in the body. Jesus says, they will know that you are my disciples by the love you have one to the other. <laughs> we ought to love each other. We ought to show love for each other. You know, I've seen people, I've seen people who, who would go to school and they would treat people at school better than they would treat their brothers and sisters. That couldn't happen in the David household. Mm -hmm. We were there for each other, and we were supposed to be there for each other. The law was unwritten, but it was spoken very often. Yeah. We made the mistake one time. My brother and I made the mistake one time and got the tussling outside. When daddy showed up, he invited the same friends in the house that saw us struggling with each other outside of the house. 
And he just went from one person to the other with his leather strap in front of all of our friends. We cannot treat other people better than we treat brothers and sisters. Therefore, the one body that he's talking about here in these verses is that the body of Christ must treat each other with love. Mm -hmm. Relationships are important. We must maintain godly relationships. We must maintain godly, godly relationship, relationships that will, will create in us peace. Paul says, that when we lose our peace, we're not walking with God. Because this peace of God gives us a new direction. If we are not sharp in the word, we need to read the word. If we think we are sharp in the word, we need to meditate on the word. If we are sharp in the word, we need to eat the word. God says to Ezekiel, Eat the whole roll. Eat the whole stroll. God says to Joshua, don't let these words of this gospel, of this Bible, of this book leave your mouth. He says, stay with the word. A lot of people have gotten in trouble because they have not stayed with the word. A lot of people who don't know the word want to tell you how to run your life through the word. Mm. It's always amazing to me when people who don't go to church can tell the church how the church ought to be acting. Mm. It's always people who have resigned themselves from going to the church that can tell the church how the church ought to be acting. It's always, it's always somebody. Well, you know, I used to go to church. Well, you just disqualified yourself. Well, you know, I used to believe in God. You just disqualified yourself. Only those who are walking this Christian walk, as many of us are, are qualified to even make Christian statements. Paul says this into the Corinthian church. He says to the Corinthian church, he says that, that those who are natural men cannot understand, cannot see, cannot even imagine the spiritual things of God because the spiritual things of God, those things are spiritually discerned. So don't waste your time talking to natural carnal men. Yes, sir. Worst thing a Christian can do is find his or herself tied up in a dispute to argue over the word of God to somebody that don't know the word. Somebody who's been saved for five minutes, five days. Somebody who just started reading the word. But now they know just enough to be dangerous. We have to have peace. When we walk in peace, peace will not escape us. When we walk in God, Peace will not leave us. Verse number 15, he says, Colossians chapter 3, verse number 15, he says, and let the peace of God rule, umpire in your hearts. The word hearts is your innermost being, your thoughts. He, he talks about your emotions. The problem with many is they get so emotionally tied up in stuff until God can't speak to them. The Proverbs writer in Proverbs 28 and 1 says that when an evil man looks around, he's running and nobody's chasing. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's sinful, they, 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 are, they are sinning and they think people are after them, but nobody's after them. You've been guilty before, haven't you? Driving down the street, and every time you see a blue and white car or a black and white car or some red and blue lights, you slam on brakes. You're not going but 45 and a 55, but every time you see the police, you slam on brakes. Because the guilty man will always come to a screeching halt because not only is he guilty this time, he, he was guilty previous times. And therefore, when he's not guilty, he still sits slamming on brakes. 
But when we let the peace of God rule in our hearts, we don't have to get us disturbed when we saw, see law, for, law enforcers near us. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 13 that the law enforcers are there not for those who are righteous, but for those who are doing unrighteous deeds. <laughs> Therefore, let the peace of God rule in your heart to which you are called in one body. You were called in one body. We are the church. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are Jesus on earth when he's gone. The Holy Spirit is in us. Sometimes I listen to people lie to me, and I don't even have to ask them for the lie. I don't have to ask them a question. They just volunteer me a lie. They just, they just, they just say what comes up. They, they've gotten so used to telling fibs. They've gotten so comfortable with doing things that, that they want to do and, and then covering it up until I just show up and they just start lying to me. When there's peace in our heart, there will be praise on our lips. When there's peace in our hearts, there will be praise on our lips. Look at what he says, and be thankful. When we have peace in our hearts, we don't have a problem with praising the Lord. We don't have a problem with being thankful. Whenever we are on one accord with the Lord, whenever we have surrendered to God, it has nothing to do with whether or not you sound good. But you are thankful. You're thankful. You're grateful to God because God has blessed you one more time. The verse 15 says, be thankful. The Christian out of God's will, the Christian who is out of God's will, will never find sincere praise to God. The Christian, the Christian, the Christian who is out of the will of God will never, ever find sincere praise to God. It's hard to praise him when you're out of his will. You, you can't get excited about praising God when you're out of his will. You have to walk in God's will. King David sets a great example to us in Psalm 51. He also does in Psalm 32. As long as David was covering his sins up, he had no peace and he had no praise. As long as David was acting like he hadn't done anything wrong, he had no peace of God, he had no peace with God, and he had no praise unto the Lord. You have to have peace with God in order to praise him, in order to be thankful to him. But let me just share with you, a person who has peace with God, a person who has peace of God, a person who has peace in God, you can't beat them praising the Lord. If you have the peace of God, if you're walking with the Lord, if you confess your sins, then you can sing. If, if you ask God to forgive you for sin, and Lord, I'm looking forward to not going back and picking it up again, oh, you can praise him. You can be thankful to the Lord because he's pulled you out one more again. Don't you know the last time you sinned, you could have died in your sin, and you ought to be raising your hand right now saying, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I'm grateful. I'm thankful for the peace of God, and therefore, because I have peace, the peace of God, the peace with God, the peace of God, I can praise him and I want to just say, Lord, thank you. You don't have to go and tell anybody what you had to be thankful for. Just begin to praise him and thank him. Number one, for who he is, he's God. He is God all by himself, the self-existing God. You ought to be thankful to him. Growing up, they would always remind you, if you didn't come out and say it, uh, that you need to be thankful for what people do for you. And when something does, somebody does something good for you, you ought, to, you ought to at least say thank you. You ought to at least be grateful. So verse 15 says that we ought to be thankful for the peace of God. 
We ought to let that peace rule in us, be our umpire, be our conscience. The reason why people can kill people and think nothing about it, they have no consciousness of God. When you have a consciousness of God, you just won't do any and everything. Verse 16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Uh-oh. That gives me a reason to sing right there. That gives me a reason. Whenever we get back to church, that gives, I want everybody to know to get over and give me, give me my solo. It says, it says that, that let the word of Christ, the word of Christ, the word of God, dwell in you richly. Get, get involved with the word of God. Let the word of Christ dwell with you. This word dwell means to reside means to be there, means to stay there. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You ought to have richness in your, your, your indwelling Christ. Everywhere we go, we take Christ with us. The last club you went to, you took Christ in there. If you're saved, the last sin you participated in, God cannot participate in sin, but don't you know that Christ is in you? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Dwell in you with enthusiasm. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Let this word dwell in you. We ought to be in harmony with God's word. We ought to be in harmony with God's word. See, there are false teachers out there. And we need to know the word of God. The word of Christ is the word of God. False teachers came to the city of Colossae. And they had man-made traditions. They had religious rules. And they had human philosophies. Paul tries to shelter these new Christians from these philosophies, from these religious rules, and from man-made traditions. We got too many man-made traditions. Too many. There are too many traditions that we have that are just man-made. And these traditions are being passed from one generation to the other, but we need to make sure that we pass it along the word of God, the word of Christ. In the midst of this, we become harmonized. We must, we must walk in harmony with God's word. Then it goes on to list a few. You have to be in wisdom with the word of God. Yes. Wisdom. It's not enough for you to have knowledge. You need to know how to apply that knowledge. Right today, people are still, people are still covering communion. And they have come to the conclusion that you're not doing things God's way if the communion is covered. Is not covered. Therefore, they cover communion because they covered it a long time ago. And they think that there is something spiritual about covering the communion. But they don't dig deep enough to know that the communion is just as spiritual without the covering. Number two, the reason why they covered the communion was because they had flies all around. They covered the communion because the covering would keep the flies off. But now we cover it because of some tradition, or so, because we think there is a, 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 a sacred thing to do. Keep the communion covered. Yes, we ought to cover it because there are critters around, but the fact of the matter is, it has nothing to do with spirituality because you got it covered. They only covered it because there were flies present. If your church is not filled with flies or have flies coming by there every now and then, 
<laughs> There's no sense in covering it. God doesn't want you to cover it. It's not to be covered because, because you saw other people covered. You are to do things according to the word of God. We have to know the word of God. God's word, God's word always magnifies Jesus Christ. When you look at the Old Testament, you ought to see Jesus throughout the Old Testament. When you look at the New Testament, you ought to see Jesus throughout the New Testament. The Old Testament is just a foreshadow of things that is to come. It foretells what's going to come. The New Testament, Jesus is printed out right there. Isaiah says, Isaiah says that, that, that I saw a virgin who had a baby and she was a virgin. Isaiah says unto us, a child is born unto us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. That same baby, that same child, that same son that Isaiah talks about in the Old Testament shows up in Matthew chapter 1. It says, this one begat, this one begat, this one begat, David begat, then Joseph. And there comes Jesus. And if you really look at Jesus' background, you'll be surprised. Yeah, he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. But Jesus came from a disturbed family. Jesus came from a dysfunctional family. Let me get a shout out right now to those of you who come from a dysfunctional family. You in good territory because Jesus came from a dysfunctional family. Now, because you came from a dysfunctional family, because you came from the ghetto, you don't have to stay dysfunctional. You don't have to stay in the ghetto. You don't have to have a ghetto mindset because that's what you came through. Jesus came from a dysfunctional family. I mean, Jesus' family had murders in it, had adulterers in it, had prostitutes in it, had brothels, <laughs> brothels uh, owners in it. Jesus came from a dysfunctional family and the whole Bible, Old and New Testament is still talking about Jesus. The question even came up, is there anything that can come good? Can any good come out of Nazareth? Jesus came out of Nazareth. So it doesn't give you an excuse whether you have a daddy on the scene or not. You can do great things. Whether your mama was a single parent or your daddy was a single parent, you can do great things in the Lord. Yeah. Whether you had both daddy and mama and they never got along, Jesus came from a disgruntled, dysfunctional, terrible, disqualified family. You can make it. I think I just blessed somebody just then. I, th I think you needed to know. You can make it, but you got to make it in the word of God. Yes. You have to walk through the word. You have to live through the word. The entire church will take on a new direction if we all stay with the word. Yes. If we stay in the word, we will have a life abundantly. Look at what it says. He says, verse number 16, Colossians chapter 6, we, we, the word, the word of Christ must dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Then he says, in teaching. In teaching. Those things that we teach, the arms of the church, every leader ought to be active in teaching. Whether you're teaching that class or not, you ought to be getting something out of the class. In our church, there's Bible study, there's Sunday school, there, there are women meeting, there are men meeting. Their children Bible study, children Sunday school. You learn most of what you learn in teaching. You learn, you learn Bible study on Wednesday night. You learn it through the teaching of the word of God. That's why it is imperative that every teacher knows his or her lesson before they stand up. Every one of them. 
Let me just share with you. There seems to be a lack of good Bible, fundamental Bible teaching in our local churches today. There is terrible examples of good fundamental Bible teaching, not only in the classroom, but also in the pulpit. Dr. Richard Rose says it best. He says, whenever there are skeletons in the pulpit, there are cadavers in the pews. Whenever there's a skeleton, meaning that when the man of God or the teacher or the preacher stands up and delivers the word, does not deliver the word as God would have him or her deliver it, whenever there is a preacher in the pulpit who is a skeleton, whenever there's no meat on the bone in the pulpit, there are cadavers in the pews. There are dead folk in the pews. They're dead. They are cadavers. They are, they are corpse. Whenever the teacher stands and the teacher does not deliver the word as the word is to be delivered by God because they are not in the word, then there are dead folk in the pews. He says to us today, dwell richly in wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing with grace in your heart to the Lord, boy, I'm singing to the Lord, not to you. That's right. And as I sing to the Lord and not to you, then there's one thing I understand. I don't have to sound good to you. I have to sing unto the Lord. Let this dwell in your heart richly as we read, as we study, and we memorize the word of God. We ought to challenge ourselves to memorize the word. My issue sometimes as I read from the New King James Version, I got the King James playing in my head by how I remembered it when I was growing up because I purposely memorized line for line in some of those passages. So as I remember the King James Version, sometimes I insert it in New King James and the reading is not there. We ought to memorize the word. We ought to study the word. We ought to read the word. My first seminary experience with at Academy, 1995, Pastor Rose made us, told us, before you get up to preach any passage, you ought to read that passage 50 times. Not, don't parse it out. Don't look up any words. Don't look up any Greek words, no Hebrew words. Before you do anything to that word in the Bible, you need to read it over and over and over and over again at least 50 times. That's why before the preacher gets up on Sunday, he should have spent at least 24 hours studying that same word, researching and he may stand for 30 minutes, but he spent 24 hours preparing for it. That's not just for preachers. That's for members. That's for Christians. That's for people to saturate themselves in the word of God. Mm -hmm. Teachers and preachers ought not be doing the Saturday night special. It ought not be a Tuesday night special for Wednesday morning or Wednesday evening. Your teaching and your preaching ought to be exemplary of what you have spent time doing, and that is studying the word. Yes. People can tell when you just jumped up, read your Bible, opened it up, and wherever it fell open, that's what you got up and talk. Mm -hmm. God deliver me from that. Mm -hmm. We have to get to a point in our lives where we understand the word. And look at verse number 16, Colossians chapter 3, verse number 16. It says we ought to admonish one another. We can't admonish one another in our own selves. We ought to admonish one another by the word of God. The word of God is what we need to admonish one another, to build each other up, to make sure that people leave their dangers in life, leave their things that are bringing them down in life. We got to admonish them, build them up through the word of God. We have people that are saying things that God didn't say. And if you're teaching and you're saying things that God didn't say, then you're lying on God. 
Let me tell you, in verse number 16, it tells us we ought to sing the word of God. And as we sing the word of God, we ought to sing the word of God according to the word of God. What would it be like if every time a new artist come out with a song, you can find the song in the word? The problem is we have a lot of churches that are singing and people are dancing to it. People are excited about it, but it doesn't line up with the word. In my day as a boy, we used to sing songs in church that made different, that made a difference in our lives, and we could find it in the Word. Now our contemporary singing has no more amazing grace in it. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was lost and now I'm found. Jesus tells this parable in Luke chapter 15 about a man who had two boys. One boy, the younger boy, took all that his daddy gave him, went off and messed it up, and he came back after he had spent some time almost eating hog food. He was broke, busted, and disgusted. The Bible says his daddy saw him a great way off. He ran to him. He fell upon his neck. He kissed him. He welcomed him home. He hugged him. And he said to the servants, go and bring a ring and put it on his finger. Bring a coat and put it on his shoulder. Put shoes on his feet. And the calf that we've been having out there on the fattening flow, bring the fatty calf, kill it, and we're going to make merry. That's what God does for us. When we confess our sins, when we fall short, there's going to be a great celebration for us if we just come back the right way. Yes. I'll believe before the Lord. The problem is, when we sing a lie, it's just as bad when the preacher preaches a lie. The word, the word. That's why we want to sing praise songs unto the Lord. Tell God how good he is. Tell God what he has already done. Yeah, we ought to tell him how he blessed us, but let's just glorify him for who he is. It says sing songs, sing hymns, unto the Lord. Sing spiritual songs unto the Lord. I'm glad to see the day that we are singing the scripture. We're singing the word of God. And the word of God is found in the Psalms. We ought to sing the song. We ought to sing the verses of the song. And then we ought not forget the heritage of the hymnologists. The hymnologist, he teaches us how to sing unto the Lord. We ought not neglect the hymns. We're going to have to get back to the, get back to the hymns. We're going to have to get back to words of, of the hymn that mean something. Because when we sing a hymn, we address God. And then it says, sing spiritual songs. And when we sing spiritual songs, we address each other. He says, look at what he says. He says, sing the Psalms. Sing the Psalms, the Psalms of the Bible. Sing from the word. Make songs from the word of God. Then he says, and when you sing hymns, the hymnologists ought to let you know that you ought to sing hymns because when you sing hymns, you, you sing unto the Lord. And finally, he says, singing spiritual songs. And then when we sing spiritual songs, we are addressing each other. We encourage each other. We're telling people, God did it for me. He can do it for you. And all this is in our song. And he says, sing it with grace in your heart to the Lord. Sing it with love in your heart. Sing it with grace in your heart unto the Lord. We are too concerned about what people think of us when we sing. We're not singing to them anyway. We're singing to the Lord. Singing to the Lord. We, have, we as believers have to sing to the Lord. And, and we have to sing unto the Lord. We have to sing and encourage each other. We have to sing the word of God. So if there are any songwriters out there, I, I, I challenge you to write your song according to the word of God. Finally, verse number 17, Colossians chapter 1, verse number 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 
Whatever you do, through word and deed, do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus' name gives us our authority. We have no power when we pray other than in the name of Jesus. And it doesn't matter if we're at a school function. It doesn't matter if we're at a Muslim mosque. If you call on to pray, if you're planning on getting a prayer through, you need to call on Jesus. Amen. Jesus is his name. Our power, our strength, our hope is in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our authority is in the name of Jesus. He says, whatever you do in word, whatever you say, indeed, whatever you do, whatever you put your hands to, whatever you put your mouth on, do it in the name of the Lord. Now, some people are doing some things in the name of Jesus, just not in the name of Jesus. I oftentimes tell people that God, the devil, and now COVID-19 are the three most lied on entities in this world. The devil, God, and COVID-19. The devil made me do it. God told me to do it. And COVID-19 got me doing this. Let's get in the word. I know, I know we can't get together as we would. I know that things are different now. I know we've been locked down too long. And then today, Fort Bend County locked us down even further. And they say it's not a lockdown, but we've gone from orange to red. And if you got any kind of sense, you'll wear your mask. If you got any kind of sense, you'll keep your distance. If you have any kind of sense, you'll make sure that you follow the CDC instructions. But there's somebody going to say, well, I'm walking by faith. Well, I'm going to do it as, as unto the Lord. The text declares to us, whatever you do, you do unto the Lord in word and deed. You do it unto the Lord in the name of Jesus. And while you're at it, giving thanks to God, the Father, through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. There's somebody with us today that has missed it. And you cannot use Jesus' name because you have not trusted him as your Savior. This is your moment tonight. You can be saved right here, right now. There's power, there's authority in the name of Jesus. And you can be saved right now, right here. But you have to trust him. You have to believe the story that Jesus died over 2,000 years ago. That he gave up his life voluntarily. You can invite him into your life right now. Just join me in prayer and repeat after me and ask Jesus to come into your life. Believing that he's the son of God and out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. The Bible says if you can believe the story that Jesus died for your sins, he was buried in a borrowed tomb, he rose from the dead, he was seen by over 500 men after he rose. The Bible says if you can believe that story and trust that story to get you to heaven when you die, you can be saved right here, right now. The door of the church is open. You can be saved right now. Will you join me and repeat after me and invite Christ into your life? Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you honestly prayed that prayer and invited Christ into your life, we believe that you're born again. And when you leave here, leave earth, you can go to heaven when you die that you are going to heaven when you die. 
And for those of you who are in between churches or don't have a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the captain. You can join by inboxing me and let me know you want to be a member of the New Beginning Church. Many have done that even on the air. You can join. Just inbox me and let me know that you want to join the New Beginning Church and you want to be a part of this church, this great church of the Lord. And those of you who need prayer, inbox me and let me know you need prayer. And we'll be glad to pray with you and pray for you. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight at the New Beginning Church from our remote location. Thank you for being a part of our service tonight. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord. We want you to participate in the giving unto the Lord tonight. You can do so in several ways. First of all, you can do so by sending your money to Cash App. Our cash tag is NBC Souls. NBC Souls. Our cash tag is, is NBC Souls. That's dollar sign NBC Souls. Dollar sign NBC Souls. Or you can uh, join us in our giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting dot jesus at yahoo.com lifting dot jesus at yahoo.com or you can give by p.o box our p.o box is p.o box 503 missouri city texas 77459 p.o box 503 missouri city texas 77459 I want to thank you for joining us tonight. It is offering time, and during this time, we want to thank you for being a part of our service. This is our Wednesday night service, our Wednesday night Bible study. We're here every Wednesday night by way of Zoom and Facebook Live at 7.20 p.m. Please continue to join us. You can join us also at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning for Sunday school. You can join us by nine, at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning for Sunday school. And certainly you can also join us for our regular service at 1045 a.m. for worship service on these same channels. We are praying now. We are praying for, for uh, Miss Virginia Brown. We are praying for you. We're praying for, we're praying for Brother Robert Miller. We're praying for Marcel Slay. We're praying for Jordan, the Jordan family. We're praying for the Myers family, we're praying for Crystal uh, Richard, we're praying for the Mason family, we're praying for Sister Carolyn Davis, we're, we're praying for Pastor Matthew Davis, we're praying for the members of the New Beginning Church, and uh, we're praying for the members of the Holman Street Church, and we'll, we're praying for the members of uh, New Mount Calvary, as God is is doing great things. We thank him for, for who he is and what he does. Let's continue to pray one for the other and encourage each other during this season. Let's build each other up. Let's admonish each other. Let's make sure that we stay with the Lord and stay in obedience unto him, that the peace of God will dwell within, within us. Let us go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for these on the prayer list. We ask you to touch, heal as only you can. We ask you to minister to and, and encourage as only you can. We ask you to comfort, Lord, as only you can. We ask you to continue to bless us to walk with you and be a part of your life and you a part of ours. We pray that you allow us to dwell in you and we allow you to dwell in us. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless us to always allow the peace of God to be the umpire who set us straight, who, who gives us rest, who gives us tranquility and silence and quietness. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for being a good God, for being the awesome God, for being the God who watches over us and keeps us. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, 
Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen and amen. Please remember to uh, to like the New Beginning page, the New Beginning Facebook page, the New Beginning Church with the cross-shaped building on it. Go ahead and like that page and then turn on the notification button so whenever we're doing something other than through my personal page, you will be a part and you will know uh, what's going on. So please, ma'am, please, sir, like the New Beginning page, turn on the notification button, and we'll be glad to continue to to be a blessing to you and you can be a blessing to us. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, continue to walk with us and we'll continue to walk with you. In Jesus' name, we thank you. <laughs>